Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Shook, Hardy, and Bacon and the Verano firm's presentation on Brazil's new general data protection law. My name is Al Cycli, and I chair Shook, Hardy, and Bacon's privacy and data security practice. Also uh, on this webinar is Camila Tabon. Camila, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Al. Uh, I'm the director of Shook's International Privacy Task Force, and I help clients proactively address data protection requirements internationally. I focus on Latin America and the European Union, and I also help companies design, build, and implement privacy compliance programs, so things like policies and procedures, notices and consent mechanisms, vendor management, data transfers, breach response, and data subject requests. So I'm happy to join you today to talk about Brazil's new law. And also in the presentation is going to be Marina Souza. Marina, would you mind introducing yourself? Not at all, sure. Hi, everyone. I am an associate at the Verano Advogados Law Firm as a Brazilian law firm with offices in Rio, Sao Paulo, Porto Alegre, and Brasilia. And uh, I am part of the firm's labor and employment practice group, and my work primarily involves providing legal advice to national and international clients in diverse industries such as banking, oil and gas, energy and pharma, and defending companies in complex labor litigation. And um, yeah, and I'm very happy to join you today for this webinar. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for, for doing this, Marina. As Marina mentioned, she's with the uh, Verano uh, Law Firm, and they are a strategic al alliance partner of Shook. And what we've tried to do, particularly in the area of international data privacy, is develop relationships with law firms in other countries that have local expertise in privacy. Uh, they truly understand the culture um, of those jurisdictions. They know the relevant data protection authorities and have relationships with them. We find that that helps us best serve our clients' needs uh, globally. So at this point, uh, I'm going to, well, actually, let's jump into a discussion of the topics that we're going to be covering. Uh, we will be addressing, of course, the law uh, as a, generally, uh, the aspects of the GDPL. We're also going to talk about some presidential vetoes uh, and how those uh, vetoes affected implementation of the law and what the law will look like in light of those vetoes, uh, key provisions for the private sector activities, what are the penalties and fines that companies could face uh, under the law, and then generally privacy in the workplace in Brazil and risk management. You know, With the law going into effect, what does that mean? What are some tips for how companies should prepare to comply with the law? And what really are their risks if they uh, don't uh, comply with the law? Uh, so we're going to talk a, a, about all of those subjects as part of, of this webinar. So I'm going to turn this over now to Marina, who's going to give us a little bit of an overview of the uh, GDPL and tell us about some of the requirements under the law. Marina? Thank you all, and uh, thank you, everyone. I will start by giving you a little bit, a little bit of background information on the law. After more than eight years of discussion, in August 14, 2018, President Michel Temer signed into law the new general data protection law. In Brazil, it's called Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados Pessoais, making Brazil the latest country to implement a comprehensive data, data privacy and protection regulation in the world. The legislation is, in is inspired by the European model. The GDPL incorporates concepts, definitions, and responsibilities very similar, when not identical to the ones within the General Data Protection Regulation that entered into, for, into effect in all European Union countries in May 25, 2018. The text follows the worldwide trend of strengthening personal data protection, guaranteeing a series of rights to data subjects, as well as imposing important obligations on processing agents. The purpose of this regulation is to boost economic and technological development in Brazil, providing a greater legal certainty to operations involving the processing of personal data in Brazil. 
Organizations will have a period of 18 months to adapt to this new legislation as the law will enter into force only in February 2020. And uh, moving on to slide four, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the vetoes that were presented by the President Michel Temer when the law was approved. The arguments used by the presidency for such vetoes was, were related to both public interest and unconstitutionality. The most relevant veto, was, which was already expected to be very, to be fair, concerned to the creation of the National Data Privacy Authority and the National Council for the Protection of Personal Data and Privacy. Several ministers and the Brazilian Central Bank mostly stood for the unconstitutionality of the provision. They basically argued that both the agency and the council should be created at the initiative of the executive branch. The creation of this agency is a central to the adequate implementation of the law, since many of its provisions determine either a decision to be taken or a measure to be adopted by this authority. Right after presenting the veto, President Michel Temer announced that a new bill of law would address the matter, but with the end of his presidential term approaching, the creation of this agency remains uncertain right now, and the new president, Jair Bolsonaro, didn't say anything about this specific law until the moment, so we don't know exactly when and if this uh, this national authority will be created, and this will definitely impact, you know, the application of the law and the compliance with the GDPR regulation. And uh, now I'm going to turn over to Camila, and she will talk about the specific requirements of the, of the law. Now I'm going to talk about some of the key provisions of the new Brazilian law, and I'm going to start off with applicability. So who does the law apply to? Um, it applies to any agent, which could be a natural person or a legal entity that performs processing of personal data. In a little bit, we'll talk about what processing means, and we'll talk about what personal data means. But Essentially, it covers any any entity, company um, that's going to be performing activities on personal data. A few exceptions are processing activities related to private or non-economic enterprises, academic, journalistic, and artistic purposes, or national security and defense or investigation of crimes. Now, the GDPL will have extraterritorial application. So it will apply to uh, processing activities that are undertaken in Brazil, uh, but it will also apply to processing activities that occur outside of Brazil if they are related to the offering of goods and services in Brazil or if they are related to personal data that was collected from individuals in Brazil. So if you have, let's say, a multinational company, you have employees in Brazil, but the main HR function is in the United States, you collected data about individuals in Brazil, your employees, even though it's being processed in the U.S., it's subject to the requirements of the law. It'll be interesting to see how this will be enforced in terms of um, organizations and entities that don't have a physical presence in Brazil, and that is one thing that remains to be seen. So data processing has a very broad definition. It essentially applies to any operation that's carried out on personal data. So obviously handling, using, accessing, transferring, but it also covers storing, um, and then reproduction, production, collection. So really anything that you can do with personal data is covered. Processing applies to um, data that's both in electronic format and in hard copy format. Um, so it's very broad. And so essentially, this law is going to cover um, all areas of a company's business to the extent that the operations process personal data. So marketing, IT, HR, legal and compliance. So a lot of things that before weren't subject to specific requirements um, are now going to be captured by the new law. <laughs> 
So the terms controller and processor are the same as we're familiar with from the GDPR. So the controller is the entity that makes decisions about the processing of personal data, and the processor processes that data on behalf of the controller. The law together refers to the controller and the processor as processing agents, and some requirements are written in terms of the processing agents. Some are specific to the controller, and some are specific to the processor. What's interesting to note is an entity can be both a controller and a processor, depending on the situation. So let's say a service provider uh, will be a processor as regards to the data it collects from its customers um, and handles on behalf of its customers, but with regard to its employees, it will be a controller. Personal data also has a very broad definition, any information related to an identified or identifiable natural person. So what we would consider typically is the name, identity numbers, uh, contact information, location data, all of that is going to be considered personal data. It's very similar to the GDPR. Sensitive data is data that has sort of stricter requirements because it, it's capable of making an individual subject to discrimination practices or some other impact to their specific rights and freedoms. So sensitive data uh, includes racial or ethnic origin, religious belief, public opinion, affiliation with trade unions or religious, philosophical, or political organizations. It includes health data. Uh, sex life and sexual orientation, and genetic or biometric information. And if Camilla, data, if I may, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if I may, I just want to give an observation about the biometric data specifically, because this will very likely impact employers using biometric clock in systems in Brazil. These employers will have to revise their current and future employment agreements and internal policies to obtain express and specific consent from their employees in order to collect and uh, to store this kind of, of data. Yeah, that's right. Because sensitive data has uh, stricter rules for handling. And we're going to talk about the legal basis for processing in a minute. but. Essentially, you have to have a legal reason for handling this data, and with regard to sensitive data, the main one is going to be consent. So to the extent that biometric data is being used for a time clock system, you're going to have to get the consent of your employees to do so. So the law talks about anonymized data, um, which is data relating to a data subject that can no longer be identified to that data subject uh, using reasonable technology available at the time of processing. And the law specifically says that anonymized data is not considered personal data. Um, so anonymized data, you have to use technical means in order to, within a certain degree of confidence, make sure that the data is not linkable back to an individual but then you have a lot of flexibility in how you can use that data. The law also mentions pseudonymized data, which is data that loses the possibility of being associated directly or indirectly to an individual unless you use additional information that's kept separate from the, the data. Um, there's no specific relaxation of requirements based on the use of pseudonymized data, but it is a concept that's mentioned in the law, and it'll be interesting to see um, how that might um, maybe relax certain requirements if you are um, storing your data in a pseudonymized format. Let's say, for example, um, in the breach uh, response, breach notification context where the data really isn't usable in the format that it was accessed in an unauthorized manner. That's still something left to be seen, but um, I wanted to mention it. So the law is based on certain data protection principles. Uh, legitimate purpose essentially means that when you are processing data, you have personal data, you have to have a legitimate, specific, and explicit purpose for handling the data. Adequacy relates to compatibility with the purpose that was informed to the data subject. So what did you tell the data subject about what you're going to be doing with their personal data and is what you're doing consistent with that? 
Necessity is processing should be limited to the type amount of data that's minimum necessary to achieve the purpose. And then there are the principles relating to data subject rights. So free access is the right that individuals have to easily access, free of charge, information about the processing of their data. Quality refers to the right to accuracy, clarity, relevance, and updating of personal data. And transparency relates to giving data subjects clear, precise, and easily accessible information about processing and about the processing agents. There's also uh, the principle of non-discrimination. So processing cannot serve a discriminatory, unlawful, or abusive purpose. And then security and accountability. So the, in, the company has to adopt effective measures uh, for security of the data, but they also have to adopt effective measures for compliance with the law and to be able to demonstrate that they are um, conducting their processing operations in compliance with the, the law. Okay, there are several legal bases for processing. Uh, there's 10, six of which are relevant for the private sector. Um, a lot of these we are familiar with from the GDPR context. You can have the data subject's consent. You can have a legal or regulatory obligation of the data controller that requires the processing of personal data. You can rely on performance of a contract with the data subject in order to process their data. Uh, you can also rely on uh, requirements or necessity for judicial, arbitral, and administrative proceedings. Then there is the protection of life or physical safety of the data subject or a third party, which means you could process personal data on that ground. And then there's the legitimate interest pursued by the controller or a third party. This, of course, is a balancing with the fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject. Um, if those should override the legitimate interest, then you cannot rely on that basis. There are a few additional notes in the law on legitimate interest that are worth noting. So uh, it requires that only the data that's strictly necessary for processing should be processed when relying on legitimate interest. The data controller must adopt measures that guarantee transparency, so individuals must be aware that their data is being processed on the basis of legitimate interests, and they must be aware of what those legitimate interests are. And we'll talk about this in another slide, but the federal authority, which is the Data Protection Authority, can request from the data controller a DPIA. So a DPIA is a Data Protection Impact Assessment which essentially is an analysis of the processing activities, what risks those activities pose on individuals, and what measures the company is taking to mitigate those risks. So in the context of legitimate interest, the federal authority can request a DPIA for those processing activities from the organization. It's interesting, in the GDPR context, you have to do a balancing when you're relying on legitimate interest. And we recommend that our clients do this balancing in writing. Um, I think here, the, the way that the law is written in Brazil, that balancing has to be a little bit more in depth and you have to formally undertake a data protection impact assessment if you're going to rely on legitimate interest. And I mean, that totally makes sense from an operational standpoint. If you, if you do the DPIA and you are certain that the rights and freedoms of the individuals are not overridden by the legitimate interest, you have your you know, record keeping and accountability mechanism so that if you get an inquiry, you have something that you can hand back instead of having to undertake um, that ex post facto. In terms of consent, consent has to be in writing or in a legally equivalent manner. Uh, it has to demonstrate the data subject's intention. Yes, I consent to you processing my personal data for the purpose you have identified. Um, it's the controller's responsibility to inform the data subject of the purposes for processing uh, prior to the processing and obtaining the consent. And the data subject has the right to revoke the consent at any time. Um, the controller has the burden of proof to demonstrate that consent was obtained. Um, and the consent can also be considered void if it's based on misleading information, 
or if it's a generic authorization. So in other words, the consent has to be specific to the processing purpose. It can't just be, yes, you can do whatever you want with my data. Um, and lastly, if there's a change in purpose that is not compatible with the original consent, the data controller must inform the data subject and the data subject can revoke a consent. Data subject rights. So like the GDPR, the, the GDPL or LGPD provides uh, several rights to data subjects with regards to their data. So the data subject has the right to obtain from the data controller information about the personal data processing activities that are performed by the data controller, um, access to the data that's being handled, rectification of incomplete, inaccurate, or outdated data. Also, they can request anonymization, blocking, or deletion of data that is either unnecessary, excessive, or processed in a way that doesn't comply with the provisions of the law. Um, they have the right to portability, so data subjects can ask the data controller to give them their information in a way that is portable, and they can then transfer to another data controller. And they can request deletion of data that's processed without the data subject's consent. They can also withdraw their consent at any time. Another uh, data subject right that is similar to one that uh, is available in the GDPR is that to the extent that the company is making automated decisions about individuals, so the easiest context to think about this is uh, in the you know, employment application process, if you're using certain filters to screen out uh, applicants in an automated basis, um, an individual has the right to request a manual review of a decision that was made based on that automated process. So that's another data subject right that is going to be available under the GDPR. In terms of liability, so the data controller or the data processor that causes damage to a data subject in violation of data protection legislation must provide compensation. So um, data processors essentially are jointly liable either where they fail to comply with the data protection legislation or they fail to follow the data controller's lawful instructions. Um, so it's important to clearly define the roles and to set out the responsibilities in the contract between the data controller and the data processor. Um, what's interesting is, is there are some, I guess, situations written out in the law where the processing agent, which in this case could be the data controller or the data processor, can prove um, certain things and to the extent that they, and if they do that, they won't be held liable. So those situations are if they can prove that they didn't perform the processing operations attributed to it, if they can prove that they didn't violate data protection legislation, or if the damage is the exclusive fault of the data subject or a third party. These are all really high bars, and it essentially shifts the burden of proof on the processing agents to prove that there was no wrong, wrongdoing instead of making the claimant prove that they're that they were harmed in some way. So it'll be interesting to see how the liability provisions will play out. Data breach notification. It will be mandatory under the new law, and the time frame is to be determined by the DPA, but it's currently written as reasonable time frame. And it could result in broad disclosures. So the way that the, the breach notification requirement is written, it's imposed on the data controller, and they must notify both the supervisory authority and the data subject of security incidents that, incidents that could entail risk or damage to the data subject. So similar to GDPR, you have to do a risk analysis when you uh, learn of a security incident that might compromise personal data in order to determine if there's a potential for risk to the data subject. Uh, and if there is, you have to inform both the supervisory authority and the data subject. And that notice has to contain a description of the personal data that was affected, the data subjects that were involved, the technical and security measures that were used to protect the data, the risks of the incident, and the measures to reverse or mitigate the effects of the incident. 
Um, so it's important, let's say in the controller data processor context, because the obligation to notify is imposed on the data controller, to look at your contract with your service providers to make sure that they notify you of any incidents that they suffer that might affect the data you have shared with them because the onus is on the data controller to conduct this risk analysis to determine whether breach uh, notification is required and then to undertake the necessary notification. So the law also has specific requirements for international data transfers. Um, so they're generally prohibited unless the transfer is to a country or international organization that provides an adequate level of protection, and the adequacy is to be determined by the supervisory authority when that's eventually set up. Um, transfer is also allowed when the controller provides guarantees of compliance with the principles set out in the law, which is a contractual obligation. So you can have a specific contract that's particular to the transfer at issue, you can have standard contractual clauses. Um, the law also mentions binding corporate rules. Uh, what's interesting is the law says that the federal authority has to specify the contents of the SCCs, the standard contractual clauses, as well as verify the specific contractual clause for a particular transfer and look at the binding corporate rules or codes of conduct. So in other words, these are mechanisms that are permitted, but they require some level of oversight by the supervisory authority, which is not yet uh, set up. If it's not set up by February 2020, I would counsel clients to sort of come up with a, a contractual template for data transfers and rely on that for your data transfers that if and when the authority is set up could be reviewed uh, after, you know, after the transfer has been in effect, but you have a legal mechanism that's sort of been driving the transfer and safeguarding the data while you've been conducting it. You can also uh, conduct a data transfer when you have the data subject consent uh, or in terms of international legal cooperation between government agencies. Data protection officer. So the the new law in Brazil requires the data protection officer of every organization, and it must be a natural person. So they have to appoint someone to to be the data protection officer. And essentially, the roles of this individual are to be the liaison with data subjects, to be the liaison with the supervisory authority and to guide the employees and the contractors of the company with regard to practices to be adopted for the protection of personal data. Um, the data controllers and data processors are required to document their personal data processing operations, in particular if they're relying on legitimate interests. So the DPO can also help with that. The DPO can also help with data protection impact assessments. So as I mentioned before, in certain instances, the federal authority can require data controllers to prepare a DPA. The DPO can help with that, and the DPO can also direct DPIAs when not specifically required. So the general risk assessment procedures internally can be, can be driven and guided by the data protection officer. Privacy by design and privacy by default. These are also concepts to consider in your compliance program. So privacy by design is really any action that's undertaken that will involve the processing of personal data has to be done with data protection in mind at every step. So the whole design process for the activity must consider privacy. Privacy by default means that once the, the plan is operational, the strictest privacy settings are going to apply by default. Um, and the national authority, when it's set up, can establish complementary norms for purposes of implementing privacy by design and privacy by default. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the penalties and fines. So the, the supervisory authority has the ability to issue warnings and orders for corrective action they can publicly disclose the violation, they can block data, or they can order deletion of data. Um, lastly, they have the right to issue fines. And the fines can be daily or one time up to 2% of the turnover 
up to 50 million reais, which is approximately $13 million, uh, which can get quite expensive. So in addition to the fines, there's also these other, um, I guess, injunctive relief or corrective actions that the, the supervisory authority can make companies do. So with that groundwork laid, I now want to turn it over to Marina to talk about the law's impact on employment relationships. Thank you, Camila. And now that we have covered the key provisions of the Brazilian General Data Protection Law, I will talk about how this new law will affect organizations doing business in Brazil in the labor and employment context. So first of all, it is important to point out that Brazilian labor law, Brazilian labor code, I'm sorry, lacks specific provisions concerning privacy in the workplace. Therefore, the legal basis for privacy protection in the employment context in Brazil comes from the Brazilian federal constitution and other federal laws such as the GDPR. And uh, considering that data subject is a natural person to whom the personal data being processed refers to, employees can classify as data subject and the Brazilian data protection law will apply to the employment relationship in this, in this, in this sense. It is also important to emphasize that under the Brazilian federal constitution, both privacy and private life have status of fundamental rights and that labor courts tend to be very protective of employees. And because of that, it is very important that organizations in Brazil pay very close attention to the new provisions of the law and adapt their internal policies and employment agreements based on the new legislation. And uh, see in workplace in Brazil, in light of the change introduced by the GDPL or LGDP, in the employment context, organizations will probably have the bigger impact on the following internal processes involving personal data. The first one is hiring and background check. The second, data, collect data collected throughout employment contracts. For example, time clock records, emails, medical exams. Also, the impact will be very big in monitoring of employees' activities throughout the employment relationship. And last but not least, termination of employment relationships. And I will talk a little bit about each one of these of this specific areas now. So first, regarding the background check and hiring process, it is important that employers be careful with what kind of information they request from employees and candidates. In Brazil, pre-scanning process is a part of a pre-contractual stage and both parties are under obligations to comply with the law. So to avoid claims of discrimination during, hiring pro during the hiring processes, for example, it is advisable to have a simplified questionnaire, and it is also advisable to avoid questions relating to sensitive data, such as a sexual orientation, origin, uh, race, marital status, and um, it is also recommended to avoid every kind of criminal background check, because those are considered illegal and uh, invasive of the candidates and employees' privacy under the Brazilian labor, labor law. Also, for the companies that usually keep a CV of a certain candidate that was not hired in an internal database for further use, it is important to, to get a consent of this candidate so this information can be kept in the internal database and not violate the new legislation. Um, the employment uh, agreement and throughout the employment relationship, appropriate steps might include a diligence process to identify what personal data is being processed by the company. And a good, start, a good starting point on this sense would be to draw a map of all employees' personal data with indication of what kind of documents 
the employers have the origin of the information with whom this information has been shared with and for what purpose this information has been collected. Another important, um, another important step throughout the employment relationship is to revise the employment agreements to make sure that they comply with the consent requirements introduced by the new law, especially concerned sensitive data. So again, for companies using biometric measures for clock and systems, the employers will have to revise their employment agreements and make sure that the data subject consent with the collection and storage of this, this specific data. And uh, the, third, uh, the third item I would say is the revision or in certain cases even the creation of internal policies addressing the collection, storage and the treatment of personal data collected in the employment context. And this is all very important so companies can avoid, you know, the application of fines that, as explained by Camilla, can be very heavy and expensive. And upon termination, organizations should be very careful and not keep personal data of former employees for longer than necessary. The law does not establish a maximum or a minimum period for the data to be kept in the employer's, in the employer's database. So a good parameter for us would be the standard of limitation. In Brazil, for labor and employment cases, the standard of limitation is two years from termination of the employment relationship. And once the labor claim is filed, the standard of limitation rules allow the granting of claims related to the five years preceding the filing of the labor claim. So in terms of keeping records of former employees, uh, a good recommendation would be to look at the standard of, the standard of limitation periods under the Brazilian labor code for this specific Perfect. And uh, risk management cycle. Based on everything we talked about, I would say that in order to comply with the new legislation, Brazilian companies and international companies doing business in Brazil and processing personal data in Brazil will have to adopt internal measures and protocols concerning the processing of personal data. In this sense, a good strategy and a good strategic plan should include the following steps. First of all, I would say it's very important to engage your team to make sure that they are on board and that they understand the importance of complying with the new legislation. The second thing is to draw a map of the data you have in your organizations. It is important to get to know what type of data you are storing, collecting, and using in the organization. The third step would be to, to draw an action plan, and this action plan would involve several business areas such as HR, marketing, legal department, and even operation. Also, it is, it is as Camila pointed earlier, it is important that organizations find a data protection officer, a DPO, because this person will be responsible for making the decisions regarding the processing of data and will be responsible, it will be the one responsible to communicate with the, with the authorities in case of a breach of, uh, of data within the company. Um, other than that, it is also very important that organizations revise their documents, their employment agreements, their internal policies, and make sure that all of those documents are in compliance with the GDPL. And it is finally, I would say that it is very, very essential to use clear and accessible language to make your employees understand the rights and the oblig and their obligations under the under the new law. And finally, I would say it is very important to keep monitoring. This is an endless process and a 
constant monitoring and training, it is important to assure compliance and avoid, you know, the application of fines by the by the agencies and authorities. And uh, now I will turn over to all. Thank you, Marina, and thank you to everybody uh, for attending today's webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Marina uh, or Camila. Direct, um, their information, their contact information, their email addresses are on this slide. I want to thank uh, Marina Sousa for participating in this webinar and giving us the local perspective on implementation of the GDPL. And uh, Camila, of course, for her work in uh, leading the international privacy uh, and data security services that we offer here at the firm and for giving her perspective on this topic as well. Uh, again, feel free to reach out to Camila or, Mar or Marina directly, and thank you for joining us on this webinar.